Well, good morning. Here we are once again. It's Sunday and uh, we're here to worship God. We are all in our own homes, but uh, God is with us wherever we are and he joins us together. I hope you've had a good week. It's been a very strange and difficult week, but I trust that you are keeping yourself safe, following the guidelines that have been laid out for us and trusting in God. This morning, I have invited a few other voices to be a part of this. And so throughout uh, the planned service for this morning, you will hear voices of some of our other church members sharing with us. But let's begin by bowing our heads in prayer. Loving God, we commit this time to you. We are in our own homes. We are apart from each other. But God, you are the one that unites us together. And so we pray your blessing on us as we listen for your voice. You are the Almighty God. You are the one who goes before us, who has laid out the path waiting for us, and then you walk alongside us as we travel together with you. And so we pray, God, that you will bless us and be with us and speak to us today. We pray this and we commit this time in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I've invited one of our church members to share with us words of a song that might be familiar to you, but words that encourage us that we might know, not know what the future holds for us, but we know who holds the future. We put it all in his hands and we put our lives in his hands. And so Sue will read to us now the words of this song. I do not know what lies ahead, the way I cannot see, yet one stands near to be my guide. He'll show the way to me. I know who holds the future and he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. So as I face tomorrow with its problems large and small, I'll trust the God of miracles, give to him my all. I do not know the course ahead, what joys and griefs are there. But one is near who fully knows, I'll trust his loving care. I know who holds the future, and he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. So as I face tomorrow with its problems large and small, I'll trust the God of miracles. Give to him my all. Thank you, Sue, for reading those words of that hymn for us. Words that I hope are a reassurance and a comfort to you that while we do not know what lies ahead, we do know who holds the future in his hands and he holds us in his hands too. I'm now going to ask one of our other members, Robert, if he will read to us the passage for today, the passage that comes from Ezekiel chapter 37. The reading is taken from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet. A vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. 
therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Thank you, Robert, for reading to us that passage of scripture. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Loving God, as we think about those words that Robert has read to us, we pray that you will open them up into our understanding. That as we consider them, we think about what our relationship with you looks like. And that you will lead us and guide us into a deeper understanding, deeper in our love for you. So speak to us through the message that has been prepared today. Speak to us, Lord, using my voice in the power of the Spirit. We pray this. Amen. So the lectionary reading today takes us appropriately to the prophet Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, a valley that is full of human skeletons, the structures of our human bodies, but devoid of all the things that make it alive. And I say it's appropriate because even though I'm here in my home today speaking with you, right next door is an empty church building filled with empty church pews. The structure of our church, but devoid of all the things that make it alive. It is simply brick and mortar. It is simply wood and screws. The prophecies of Ezekiel are written to the people of Israel who are living in exile, exiled from all that is familiar, from their homes and from their towns, from the countryside that they know so well, from their temple, their places of worship, the places that they associate with the presence of God. And through Ezekiel, God brings these people words of comfort, words of reassurance that even though they are in captivity, that even though they are kept apart from the things that they are familiar with, God is in control and God will bring them through this. And in this particular vision, God is reassuring them that even in the circumstances where there seems to be no hope and there seems to be no life, God can and will bring restoration. And I believe that this passage speaks to us in our present crisis, to us as a church, to us as individuals. For some of our churches dotted around the island and all over the world, this is a worrying time. This is a time when we look to the future and we don't know what is waiting there for us. Where we can so easily be filled with hopelessness about the future of our churches. Will things ever be the same again? But this passage reminds us that lifeless church buildings don't mean that the church is without life. That God is the God of life. And it is Him that brings life into the places where all we see is hopelessness and impending death. And that new life that God brings might not look like the old life. Through the prophet Isaiah, God says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. When Ezekiel looks down on this valley, he sees bones that have no life in them. They are not the source of life for our bodies. They are merely the recipients of life. On their own, they are just dry bones. Our church buildings on their own are not alive. They are not the source of life for us as our churches or for the communities around us. They are just the structures that we use to bring life. But the words that we read today from Ezekiel are words of reassurance to us because God goes about bringing life. God goes about bringing true life. God goes about bringing new life, not just the, the, the impression of life or the appearance of life, but he brings true life to the things that we think 
have been laid to waste. When God brings about restoration to these bones, he does it in two stages. His first instruction to Ezekiel is to speak to the bones and to say this, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And in hearing the word of the Lord, we read that there is a noise, a rattling sound, as the bones come together, bone to bone. And then when Ezekiel looks, what he sees is tendons and flesh starting to attach themselves to the bones and skin covering them. Listening and hearing the word of God and being obedient to the word of God is the first step in life being restored to the places where there seems to be no life at all. And for us, that means opening up our Bibles. It means reading the word of God, getting to know the word of God, but also allowing the word of God to read us, to speak to us into our lives. Even the things that we don't want to hear, even the things that we find difficult, that we don't want to change, the bits that challenge us, challenge us in the way that we live our lives, challenge us in the things that we believe, and then to respond obediently to what we read and what we hear, just as the bones were obedient in their response and flesh began to appear and skin covered the flesh and suddenly there were signs of life. But just signs of life, not life itself. When Ezekiel gazes on these bones, what he sees is that even though they are now covered in tendons and flesh and skin, there is still something missing. There is no breath in them. Without breath, without the Spirit of God, even though things might appear to be alive, they're not really alive. Knowledge and understanding and obedience to the Word of God is just the first step. It's only the first part of life being restored. restored. But knowledge of God is not enough. More than knowing God, we need to experience God. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, is simply not enough. People can truly know that Jesus loves them when they experience his love. And people experience God's love when God lives in them. And people experience God's love when God's people, the church, filled by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, and empowered by the Spirit, share God's love with them. A Spirit-led community of people can bring life and transformation to a world that offers nothing beyond the boundaries of this life. In your worries about what the future of the church looks like, of your church looks like, Take heart in the knowledge that God is at work even now. Because it's not your church and it's not my church, but it's his church and it is precious to him. God is at work right now in all that is happening, in all the struggles and all the suffering and all the uncertainty. God is at work and he's doing something. He's doing something different and he's doing something new. In the words of the song by, by Hillsong Worship, in the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. In these difficult times, God is at work and God invites us to be at work with him. And it's not through our wonderful big buildings that we join in him, join with him, and it's not through our great theological understanding of scripture that we join with him it is in the power of the holy spirit at work in us and at work through us that life is restored into our cities and our towns and our neighborhoods god is at work and his church is secure but maybe this passage is also speaking to you as an individual in our conversations this week that I've been having with people, what we're hearing is that 
people are starting to ask questions. People are starting to look towards God for reassurance and strength and understanding about what is happening, where perhaps in the past they might have looked elsewhere. And if that is you, that is wonderful. That is such a wonderful thing to hear. That people are looking to God to make sense of what they are seeing and experiencing. Perhaps you have been part of a church and you love attending the Sunday morning service and you love attending the Bible studies and the prayer meetings and it was these activities that kept you going, that helped you get through each week, but now they're gone. Or maybe you've not been a part of a church and you found meaning and purpose in your life through maybe your work. Or maybe heading out to socialize on the weekend in pubs and clubs. Or maybe through some sport that you've played. But now these are gone. And you start to realize that these things only gave meaning and purpose to your life when you were able to do them. I remember when I was a younger man. Football was my life. I loved it. I couldn't wait for the weekend to play football matches. I loved scoring goals. And then... After um, playing football on a Saturday night um, or a Saturday morning, I would find myself going out on the Saturday night. Not, couldn't wait. Couldn't wait to head out on Saturday night. Off to the clubs, off to the bars and just having a good night out. Enduring the weekdays because I couldn't wait for the weekend. And then I remember waking up one Saturday morning. Hadn't been out the night before. Hadn't been out drinking. And just thinking to myself, wow. It feels so good to wake up without a hangover. I'm coming to the realization that there was greater meaning to my life than football could ever offer. That the things of this world come and go, but God is eternal. I was dry bones encased with flesh, encased with tendons, encased with skin. I had the appearance of life, but without the Spirit of God in me, I wasn't really alive at all. It is God in me, my relationship with him and his presence in me that gives my life meaning and purpose. And that hasn't changed simply because I can't do the things that I once did, whether that is because of this lockdown that we're in or because my body has just become too old for me to run around for 90 minutes on a football field. Or perhaps you were like, you are like my wife once was. And I have permission to share this. Uh, from her otherwise this might be the last message that I share with you but maybe you are like my wife once was she did all the things that Christians were expected to do she went to church on a Sunday morning she went to youth club she read her Bible every day she prayed every day but then she came to a point when she was a teenager when she realized that this simply wasn't enough that there was more to being a Christian than simply doing the Christian things. She knew all about Jesus, but she didn't know Jesus as her personal saviour. A living relationship with Jesus goes beyond just knowledge of who Jesus is, beyond knowledge of what the Word of God says. It goes beyond being a good person who does good things. Having the knowledge of Jesus is not enough. You have to experience Jesus. Here in Northern Ireland, we love to sing that old hymn. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. But you know, that's simply not entirely true. Because even though Jesus lives, there are a lot of people who cannot face tomorrow. Or will find it very hard to face tomorrow. It's not because he lives that I can face tomorrow. It's because he lives in me that I can face tomorrow. If you are watching this or if you're listening to this and you're starting to ask questions about meaning and purpose and God in the midst of all of this, then I want to point you towards the answer. The answer is found in Jesus. It's found in his desire to be in a relationship with you to come into your life and to be a part of your life. It is in Christ alone, as the song goes, that my hope is found. He is my life. He is my strength, my light and my song. He is my comforter, my all in all. 
We're going to pray now. In the first part of this prayer, I want to pray for those people who are struggling because of this virus. And that might be because they are suffering from this virus. It might be because loved ones have contracted this virus. It might be because being in isolation is really hard. And not being able to do the things we once did is really hard. And we want to pray about that too. But we also want to pray for those people who are putting themselves at risk, who are putting themselves at the forefront of this battle against the virus. On Thursday evening at 8 o'clock, we were out in front of the house clapping. Not too many houses around us, but there were a few other people out there clapping. And I know all across Cookstown on Thursday evening, there were people clapping and saying thank you to those medical staff of all types who are doing so much to keep us safe. And we thank you for that and we want to pray for you today as well. But there is another prayer that I want to invite you to pray with me. And I'll have the words up on the screen if you want to see them and pray with them. Especially if something that I've said today, something that you've heard today, is spoken personally to you. And you want more. You want more of what this world can offer you. You want Jesus and all that God can offer you. It's a type of prayer that is sometimes referred to as the sinner's prayer, but the truth is that we're all sinners. So every time we come and we pray to God, we're praying a sinner's prayer because we are sinners. So let's rather call this a fresh start prayer, an opportunity for you to make a fresh start with God in your life. It's not some magical incantation. It's not some magical words that we say. It is merely a confession of who we are in relation to God. It's an understanding of how much we need God and we need Jesus as our Savior. It's a chance to make a fresh start, but remember that it is just a start. It is not the be all and end all of things. It is the beginning of things. And if you do say this prayer, if you do pray this prayer with me today, what I want you to do is let somebody know that you've prayed it. Let somebody know that you have invited Jesus into your life to be your savior. And to others, if somebody makes contact with you and says to you, I've invited Jesus into my life, then I want you to encourage them. I want you to come alongside them because you know what? When we give our lives to Jesus, it is a tough choice to make, but it is also a tough life to live. Fortunately, when we become followers of Jesus, we become part of a family, we become part of a community. So you don't walk this journey on your own. There are people to walk it with you. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and phone somebody that you know that you can trust, somebody that you know is a believer in Jesus. And speak with them and let them walk with you. And if you don't know anyone, look onto the irishmethodist.org website. Find the number of Cookstown Methodist Church and give me a call. And I'll chat with you. But you're not in this on your own. God is with you. And God's family is with you. So I want to encourage you to think about that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Loving God, we lift up to you today people who are struggling because of this virus. Lord, there are people that we know, people who are a part of our extended church family. And maybe even people listening today know someone in their own family. Or is someone who is suffering from this virus. We pray, God, that you will bring strength to the bodies to endure and fight against it. We pray that in the anxiousness, they will know your peace. Bring healing. Bring comfort. And bring peace into the hearts and minds and bodies of those who are suffering from the coronavirus. Bring a peace to the family members, to the loved ones of those suffering. May they hand it all over to you. May they trust you with their lives, with their well-being. 
We pray, God, for those who are living in isolation, for those who are finding it hard to be on their own, to be confined into the walls of their home, to maybe stepping outside into the garden for a bit of fresh air, but not being able to go about the things they would normally do, not to be able to come into contact with family members and friends. Loving God, may they know that in their time on their own, they are not alone, but you are with them. You are their comfort. And we pray, God, a prayer of thanksgiving for all those who are at the forefront of this battle. The doctors, the nurses, the specialists, the chemists, those delivering medicines to people's homes, those going into people's homes as carers and helpers. And other medical staff, Lord. We give you thanks for them and we pray for them. We pray that you will protect them, keep them safe from infection, keep them safe from hurt and from harm, of words that harm. May they only hear words of encouragement and love spoken into their lives. We pray that you will bless them and keep them close to you. If you are ready to make a fresh start, if you are ready to do something new with God today, then I invite you to pray this prayer with me as the words appear on the screen. Dear God, I'm starting to realize that the things in which I've placed my trust in the past have little value. I want to put my trust in you. I want to follow you. I want you to be my Lord and my Saviour. Please forgive me the things I've done that have been hurtful to you, to others and to myself. It is only through your grace that I can find forgiveness because of Jesus' death on the cross. It is only by putting my faith in you that I can share in his resurrection to eternal life. Please send your Holy Spirit to live in me, to make me a new person and to help me to follow you. Thank you that I can face both life and death now that you are my saviour. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've prayed that prayer, if you're ready to take that step and, and receive Jesus as your saviour, if you're ready to find your meaning and your purpose for life in him, that's wonderful. But please do let somebody know. Please let somebody know that you have made this decision in your life Phone somebody and, uh, and let them encourage you. And if somebody phones you, please encourage them. Please encourage them in what they're doing. Pray with them, be excited with them uh, and keep in touch with them. So last week when we closed the service um, or whatever we want to call this, uh, we shared the grace together. And we're going to do that again. It might seem a bit strange or sound a bit funny when you sit in your home on your own. And you're doing it all alone or maybe just one or two people with you. But it's a great way of reminding us that we're not on our own in this. As you say those words, there are many more saying it with you in their own homes uh, or wherever it is that they are. Uh, and if you're not sure of the words of the grace, again, I will put them on the screen for you so that you can see uh, what those words are. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ... The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all on this day and forevermore. Amen.